folks, Master Coex here. It's quite a challenge to come up with content regarding Dragon Ball, especially since the manga decided to dump Black Freezer on us and then scamper away until Christmas, giving us five months of discussing what just happened. What a way to keep us talking, Toyotaro. You're learning your clickbait. But when in doubt, it's always time for a list. Now you may think that, oh, we're just cheaping out with this kind of mediocre idea, like it's some kind of secondary afterthought. But that got us thinking. What about them secondary characters? If there's something to say about Super, you can certainly say that the people and characters they introduced have certainly left their mark, mostly for the better. And no, we're not talking about the big players, your Hits, your Khaliflas, your Jirens, your Zamasus and whatnot. And to speak of them in this video would be a little bit pointless since they're not secondary characters. No, let's talk about those and even some tertiary characters really pull things thin. Those who, despite their very limited status, managed to enrich the universe on Dragon Ball anyway, without even really trying. They just existed and were still able to provide some enrichment for us. In fact, sometimes they do a better job than some of the more fleshed out characters. We are going to use all of Dragon Ball Super's media. That means the anime, the manga, and all four movies. We count Battle of Gods and Resurrection F as super movies, even though they're called Dragon Ball Z, such and such. So without boring you guys any further with an overly long introduction, let's get to the meat of the topic, shall we? Number 10 goes to what is a deep cut, but something I actually quite like, Barry Khan. Havarok though wasn't so keen with this idea when we were discussing our list, but I felt that it was definitely worth talking about, at least a little bit, just to get us started. Once mentioned in the Boo Saga in a magazine, was brought to life in Super. Cool. I was quite blown away with this throwback reference actually and was very curious to see how it would play out. And I was both pleased and disappointed with the outcome. Pleased to see the actor role being fleshed out more from that face gag and cameo, but I was also saddened to realize that, oh God, great, he's a bit of a jerk. Nevertheless, his inclusion and possession by a Wagashian managed to provide some kind of side story for Gohan and Videl, and actually gave Super Videl some sort of a personality, albeit making her a little bit creepy in the process. Gohan would never do that. He would never leave me. He can't. If you say it in a particular way, the Yandere vibes are very palpable. Yeah, give me some Kudere or Dandere any day. Barry's addition was a nice little bit of world building for us and gave Gohan a nice little subplot before the Tournament of Power and also showed at the time that he did care about his family. That is until Superhero came along and just steamrolled all over that and it was up to Piccolo to effectively save his marriage. Then we moved to Iriko one of Jaco's associates in the Galactic Patrol. We'd actually been introduced to Iriko and the Galactic King before, but really, it was during the Galactic Prisoner arc, that's Moro's saga, which managed to show us that the Galactic Patrol was more than just a gag organization. They actually did stuff, albeit in a bureaucratic manner. They had some sort of influence over the galaxy. And whilst we saw some colorful members of the organization from time to time, including Miris. One of the more underrated members of the squad definitely has to be Iriko. If you look carefully, he's pretty much there the entire time, shadowing Jarko and being a dependable second. He is eager, yet competent, and for a moment, even plays the role of Vegeta's sidekick during his training on Yardrat. He's not a character though that immediately comes to mind when you're talking about the best characters that Super had to offer, since we really don't get much time with him in order to develop his character further or maybe even probe his backstory. But he did his job well enough, and the purpose of this list is to thank some of the less obvious, underrated background players. Give them kudos. And honestly, for being just a regular galactic patroller, Iriko seems to be far more competent than Jarko at times. It might not be much, but he does an honest job, and his simple design is kind of adorable. Now, if you're wondering about when a Saiyan might show up in this list, look no further than Beats. He is no dead Beat. Oh, ah, awkward. One of the cooler aspects of the Broly movie was showing us bits and pieces of Saiyan society. It turns out that it wasn't only made up of warriors and fighters, but also those who performed the more menial tasks and engineering. It was more of a complete society than we might have previously thought. Among those characters was an engineer by the name of Beats, who helped Paragus in his search for Broly, and then got betrayed at the first sign of trouble. Most likely eaten as well. Well, I mean, given their naming structure, it kind of makes sense. 
vegetables. We've included Beats on this list because he fully introduced the idea of an entirely non-combat focused Saiyan to us, and in our eyes, kind of gave the Saiyans more credibility as a cohesive unit and people. Before the likes of Gine, there are theories about her past, but we'll save those for another video. And himself, Saiyans were only imagined as warriors, which was cool to begin with, but felt rather limiting in the scope of world building. Fighting can only get you so far. Thanks to the Broly movie, we now see Saiyans in a more relatable way. Beats is also a positive type of character. He's loyal to Paragus, despite his fears, and he wants to help the commander in finding his son, genuinely, only for it to end tragically. He performed the role that he was given well, and has expanded our um, understanding of Saiyans in the process. Not bad for a character who only like had three scenes, right? Now we're going somewhere a little more angelic, in the form of Mojito. Arguably one of the more interesting angels going. From Universe 9, this guy was not really much to look at, but when you step back and look at the possibility and connotations behind him and his persona, you'll begin to understand why we rate him quite highly. Above his other siblings, in fact. While extremely minor as a character, he opened up the whole angels are up to something narrative during the Tournament of Power, like something was going on. This guy was our first hint that there was something more at stake than just, well, the tournament. While we see him exhibit an unnatural amount of emotions for an angel, we see him as angry, pleased, and disappointed, what people focused on mostly was his general reaction to Universe 9 being erased. Sidra and Ro, oh, they were gone. And it having some sort of a sinister undertone. While it was never explained entirely, he seemed happy that his universe was wiped clean and left him unscathed, hinting that the angels knew all along what the true purpose of the tournament might have been. It's that little bit of the meta plot that remains kind of mysterious to this day. Was the GP gambling the entire time? Was it a possible coup and power grab from Zeno? Had Super gone on for a little longer, I'm sure that subplot would have been fleshed out more, but you can tell around episode 125 that things were being told, the higher ups telling the super team that you should wind up faster than what was previously expected. Or might this have been more straightforward, that you know, he was simply teaching the gods an important lesson? Hard to say for sure, but it was Mojito who first planted the seeds of suspicion in the audience, that things might not be as they seem. Catopestra, oh, Boy, this guy was a gem. One of my favorite characters introduced in the tournament saga. Oh, he's so cool and distinct, but I've done my best and not given him the top spot this time because I've got to be realistic. But in terms of his base look and tone, oh, I'm sold. Now, we saw a lot of interesting fighters during the tournament of power, apart from those that came from universe 10 because they were just varying degrees of muscle men, except for Lilybo. And we've discussed them all on many occasions. You know that we have a soft spot for two particular fighters, both from Universe 3. Bororetta, who is practically a channel meme now thanks to his design, and Kato Pesra. Some people might hate him, but we personally love him for how over the top he is. Our boy here has some really cool action scenes, whilst also being so delightfully silly. Even giving Vegeta a bit of trouble, he has to go Super Saiyan to deal with him. And all of this even invokes the spirit of the original Dragon Ball and the more outlandish fighters. Also, take a look at this face, how stern and serious he is. He is devoted to his job. And his mode change is genuinely funny and might be a little jab at the Super Saiyan color schemes and the multipliers, etc. 300 times this, 300 times that. So yeah, he's the best. But not the best of this list since he didn't get much in the fleshing out department but he definitely left a glowing feeling in our hearts. We head to the recent saga that has just finished in the manga and to the sidekick of Granola, the AI targeting computer, Oatmeal. We don't have many AI characters in Dragon Ball, so giving Granola a synthetic companion was quite interesting. We were debating what kind of entity Oatmeal was for the longest time. Was he a guy in the chair, someone else, and the goggles were just a tool in his schemes, an arsenal? Well, okay, it wasn't that elaborate, he actually just was a computer. But at least Granola had a deadpan friend. Not only is he quite resourceful, I mean, he's a piece of eyewear that compiled the spaceship, that's pretty neat already, but he also serves as Granola's conscious, which is quite interesting and a nice step away from the soulless machine trope. Whilst we would love to get some more context about who built Oatmeal and how this unlikely partnership began, we are still happy that Oatmeal has been one of the small highlights of the latest manga saga and we really hope to see him and Granola again in the future. And maybe we might work him into some of the other stories. Mm -hmm. This one might be a little bit weird, but 
Monarca. While he might have gotten a bigger presence than a lot of the characters on this list, Monarca is certainly not a major player in the Dragon World. He doesn't want to be either, that's what makes him bearable. His constant struggle to get away from Beerus' weird demands is also refreshing. Goes to show that not every being in the Dragon World wants to fight, sometimes they just want to go about their lives. Nonetheless, he was a key in teaching Goku and Vegeta a lesson, but ironically, he has also assisted Hit in Beerus getting back at Champa. This hard-working delivery man is so wonderfully dispassionate about anything that isn't his work, it just makes him comedy gold as a kind of character, just for subversive purposes. True, we wish that he was a double twist, that, you know, he did actually have latent potential, that even he was unaware of, but it is nice to see him pop around from time to time. It gives the Dragon Ball universe a certain familiarity to it. I actually did a discussion about him a while back, about this exact plot theory I had. It would be so fun to see Monarca actually being the strongest in the universe, struggling to control a power that he actually does not want. Maybe we'll make a full what-if in the fullness of time, who knows. We head to Yardrat next to the being Pibara. We absolutely love Pibara on this channel, and if you've been watching our what-if series on the regular, you can really tell how much we enjoy using this guy in them. He adds another facet to interstellar training that has proven critical in building up certain plot threads. It's just so nice that the one who taught Goku instant transmission back in the day was finally given a face. And also his light-hearted demeanor greatly contrasts with his new student Vegeta. He has the largest amount of patience going in the galaxy to deal with him. Seeing those two interact is quite precious, and honestly sells the prince's gratitude toward Pibara even more, and Pibara could tell how big a deal that was. Also, canonizing both designs of the Ardratians was simply the right thing to do, and we love it. The other design originally coming from the game Dragon Ball Online, a very, very handy well information and designs that Toriyama cannot stop using these days. We hope that one day characters other than Saiyans can start training with Pibara, and that it won't be relegated to a what-if only scenario, that the real story will actually use it, as they could really benefit from meeting this guy. Superhero introduced us to Carmine, and oh man, Carmine presents! I don't know what's funnier about this guy. His little editing YouTube hobby, the special bubble in the car made for his magnificent coiffure, or how serious he is about himself, despite being a really goofy character. Whenever he's on the screen, you know that you're going to have a good time. We also know that Magenta holds him in high regard, despite his weird nature. Though it is clear that he does have a darker side to him, as he does not hesitate in aiming his weapon at Pan, even though it would never have any effect on her at all. Now while it's entirely possible that he has perished in Cell Max's explosion, that would make his demise off screen, which feels honestly weird for one of the poster characters of the new movie, so there might be a chance that he might have survived to strike again later. And knowing what he knows, he could either end up as a henchman for another villain, or a comedy relief figure. So fingers crossed for his survival. After all, it would be a shame to lose those mad editing skills. We wrap things up here with an unexpected item in this particular bagging area. Janet. Janet? What? Well, if you're a Piccolo fan, you'll know exactly who Janet is. Although this character doesn't have an official name, Chris Sabat decided to give her one. Also, she isn't in many scenes, but she still stole the hearts of the audience with her stoic attitude towards all the weird stuff that's been going on lately. And although Piccolo, for all we know, is aromantic and asexual, people really want these two to date. How could she not be on this list? That is the exact point of this list being a very, 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 very minor character, yet making a big impact. Damn it, Janet, you're good. Not to mention that her design is just so natural, and not like other instances that have darkened Dragon Ball's doorway in the past. Congratulations, Toriyama, took you 40 years, but you did it. We're honestly interested if someone in the Dragon Room will actually recognize Janet's immense popularity within the Western fandom, and that we might see more of her in the future talking with Piccolo. Perhaps maybe the first time that she and Piccolo met? But come on, we gotta be real, Toei doesn't care about the desires of international audiences. But considering that the big green guy who kinda looks like the guy who wanted to rule the world not that long ago is now your friend, and you're not shaken about that, his presence, and him picking up one of your students on the regular? Yeah. Janet must have seen some really serious stuff in her lifetime. So there we go, a list of characters that were in the background or had little influence in the story to begin with, but at the end of the day really made a difference. Who would, ha who would be your choices? We'll gladly read them in the comments, so let's get this discussion going, and I will see you in the next video. Catch you later!